son of Albert H. Mainwaring, who was uh, a co-founder with a, a Mr. Norman Jack back in the 1930s in the, in the Depression of a small metal tubing operation. It was just the two of them. When World War II started in Europe, the uh, demand for the product increased. Uh, Mr. Jack wanted to bring his son into the business and the two partners couldn't really agree on how that should go and uh, they decided to split. During the war, uh, the early part, I was still in school, high school, I would spend weekends and summers at, in that little shop helping out on odds and ends. We had very little capital, but we wanted to expand as well. And we built it up to approximately six people. But that was about all we could crowd into that little shop. My wife and I looked around and found a, a, an old farmhouse with a barn in Lower Providence Township, Montgomery County. And we bought that place on a, a GI Bill and uh, pl planned to then move the, 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 the company into the barn. Gordon and Bruce Mainwaring uh, were business partners for 46 years. Dad and, and Bruce essentially had a, a marriage. His expertise was in uh, what, what they now call human resources. In those days, it was just personnel. <laughs> uh, he handled all that sort of thing, and then I shuffled all the paper and did all the slide rule work on working on the technical side. So it turned out to have been a happy partnership, and we stayed as partners for 46 years. He was a goal setter. Uh, he loved making lists and then being able to cross things off that list. But I think he was very analytical, um, and he would, he would look at the big picture. Bruce and had very much had their way of running these businesses. Um, so they might have been in different technical fields, but the management philosophy was the same. They're one of the few partnerships that, uh, you know, survived the test of time. Um, and I mean that because the only thing that broke it apart was, you know, Hatt's premature death. Uh, so those two got along f uh, fabulously. They respected each other and they very much complemented each other. So, you know, one was the, the, the people person and one was the strategic visionary. The key was the employees. I know he was very dedicated to the employees, making sure that, you know, they were happy and things were being run well. Our main customer then from that, that period uh, was a, a company called Tensolite Insulated Wire. And uh, they actually sold uh, and uh, built their business around insulated wire with metal sheaths on it. Um, so we did that uh, for them for quite a few years uh, on a toll basis. They would send the wire and we would make the tubing the right size and insert the wire and then draw the tube down onto the wire. It wasn't a large business. A company in New York uh, found out about our capability, but they wanted to have a much more precise control 
over the size of the tubing and the, the tightness that it fit over the wire. It was our introduction into getting into uh, micro, what we ultimately called micro coax. And it was micro because coax had been made for years in much larger sizes by uh, cable manufacturers. But this was a very specialized requirement than for aircraft and uh, ultimately for spacecraft. Bruce and Hat were both good guys to work with. It was just a, a very good relationship. Now I can't say that for 46 years we never had any arguments, but we never had one that was really disruptive. Uh, so as a result, the business uh, was able to grow. From the day I started with it, and I kept moving up the ladder and growing and things like this, and it just, it just made me happy the whole time. Now I have to cut this piece out. I started January the 2nd, 1963. I'm presently running the two extruders making Teflon coated wire. Lloyd's retired officially uh, several years ago um, and just didn't want to stay home and, and sit around the house. We had a retirement party for him so long ago, I forget what it was, but he said, well, I'll be available, you know, if you need me, and then we needed him, and so he was available, and then he, we needed him again, and he was available. You know, he shows up at four in the morning, goes home at noon, you know, uh, I'm sure his wife is glad to get him out of the house. I love working. I, I couldn't be retired and just stay home, that's not me. I told him I'd give him at least another five years, if not ten. My father was Alexander Wallace McRae. He was the first general manager of the Micro Delay Division of Uniform Tubes, which became Micro Covax. He was with the company for 11 years, and he was definitely a people person. One at one five five. And um, I think his management philosophy was just work hard and do your very best, and that's all they expected, you know. It was very family environment back, back in the 60s and 70s, so it was like a very close-knit company. Uh, Al McRae ran the business, but he had, on one night I, I was called at, on the phone at 2 a.m., and, and uh, Al McRae had had a heart attack and passed away, just like that. I think he'd be really proud, you know, because it was still in, in its beginnings, you know. The technology was there, and I'm sure he'd probably be thrilled with how far it's come. I was hired by Gordon Hattersley to manage and grow the micro delay division of Uniform Tubes. He brought in the, the technology that we needed to convert what was a mechanical capability into a comprehensive product which would meet demanding electrical specifications. And that's what he did, step by step by step. Dr. Bob was running uh, microcoax when I joined in 1989. It's a shining example of a private company that has withstood the test of time. We decided that we needed to have a, a, a different approach to managing because it was getting to be a complicated business. We had about 50 employees in the U.S. at the time and two employees in our U.K. operation. So it was a small company.
Coming in as president, it was the end of the Cold War. The business was largely tied to the defense market. And so, you know, we were retrenching and shrinking the business. Um, and, and so that presented a lot of challenges. And luckily at that time, uh, we had some inklings that people were buying our cable uh, related to the, the beginning of the cellular boom. We had a piece of cable in every Nokia handset in the 1990s, um, which, you know, really saved the company uh, because, you know, the defense market had just collapsed after uh, the Cold War ended. And then the handset you know, business changed dramatically. They were trying to reduce costs. They eliminated our components. And we decided to go into the satellite market. Um, and luckily, we had not abandoned our military customers like a number of our competitors did. When 9-11 happened and the defense boom uh, you know, took off, we were positioned uh, to do very well in that. We had positioned ourselves um, by reinvesting, and that's what we, we do. We constantly you know, reinvest in the business, and, and that facilitates the transformation. So it seems like every 10 years or 15 years, you're flipping the business from one you know, market concentration to another. Managing Innovation, I guess, as you go along, applies, and innovation is the key in the technology and this kind of business that MicroCoax does. Congratulations on 50 years, MicroCoax. I want to thank the team of employees at MicroCoax and Kroll Technologies for 50 years of tremendous success and wish us the best for the next 50. Congratulations MicroCoax on a fantastic 50 years. Congratulations to the, to the employees of MicroCoax for reaching this milestone and uh, we have yet to see the best. It's ahead.